<laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay, so we we um, heard that uh, sixteen point five minutes worth of, of uh, you. Uh, you know, in the in the history of time, I think those uh, 19, 19 minutes will probably be watched over and over by many people. I, I, I find it to be a very good uh, summary of sort of where things are today. So what I've been thinking is there's sort of a race now between the modalities of xeno transplant and the stem cell generated organ and the bioengineered organ in terms of which one will reach the clinic the quickest. How, how do you see, do you also see that race between those three modalities? I, I would imagine that you're, if, if you had to pick a horse in that race, you'd pick your, your, your own horse. So how, how quickly do you think this area is is going to progress. You know, one of, one of the problems has been the tremendous pressures on people in both directions. The the pre pressure in uh, uh, California and and with CIRM uh, uh, supported researchers to show progress on the stem cell side. The the tremendous investment of the you know, dialysis and sort of traditional renal medicine community, on the other hand, to assume that renal medicine is going to remain the same as it is now for decades moving forward. So it's very, very hard to get a very accurate picture of how fast these things are actually likely to move. What's your own thought about that? Well, I, I think that science is, is quite predictable. Uh -huh. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, science is quite unpredictable, and sometimes the progress can be slow. Uh, and so we really don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, and so that unpredictability sometimes is, is actually what makes it exciting, because we might uh, discover new things that will lead to, uh, to new treatments in the future. So when you talk about some of the work that we're doing in uh, scaffold repopulation and then the, uh, the work in xenotransplantation, uh, they're not entirely mutually exclusive no. uh, on several different levels. And so uh, in one sense, uh, we can, we actually use uh, animal scaffolds. So in, in that context, that it, it is xenotransplantation. Uh, the other uh, route uh, which may be something in the future that we foresee is that uh, we might be developing human cells in animals uh, mm -hmm. because there's been a lot of work now in, in genetic engineering and, and some of the work that you mentioned coming out of uh, the California Institutes where, uh, where they can actually develop uh, human cells in, in animals that have uh, humanized immune systems, for instance. And so, uh, that might be a, a new way in the future and a, and a, and a method by which the, the cells are, are obtained. We just don't know. So um, I think that's one of the exciting things is that, that these two areas of engineering and, and xenobiology might actually come together uh, in, the, in the years to come. I think the progress is coming in that direction. Yeah. So when, when we talked to Shuvo Roy, he, he was quite specific that there might be clinical trials starting in like two years in the bioengineered kidney. Do you see clinical trials starting on the stem cell generated kidney or, um, you know, the, 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 the uh, technologies that you're currently working on? One, one thing that intrigued me, I, I went to the regenerative medicine meeting in May of 2014. They had uh, a beautiful art show, regenerative medicine-based art. And one of the interesting things in that art show is taking a mouse or rat kidney and blowing it up to human size <laughs> and showing you know, the, the various phases of uh, regenerative medicine, you know, before you um, 
decellularize it when when you make the you know decellularized or organ and so on doing all, all that in in human sized kidneys but that are obviously ro rodent kidneys blown up and it made me realize that even in that art show there are tremendous pressures to to um, to indicate that the progress towards doing this in uh, human beings is, is moving very quickly and and yet there are a lot of barriers still to to be crossed uh, making sure the right cells end up in the right places and lots of other things so what are your thoughts about when clinical trials might start yeah so that's one thing we that's going to be much further in the future I think that you know uh, dr. Roy's technologies that he's been working with with uh, um, more of the bio implantable filtration system of the kidney is uh, um, is quite cutting edge and they've been working on this technology since the late 90s uh, 2000s mm -hmm. with uh, with dr. Hume right. uh, as well so uh, they've progressed to the fact that they've been doing some large animal implantation trials that they had um, um, published as well so uh, you know they're they're probably pretty close to, to doing human trials, but we're looking at, so I think that um, our hope is that a, a engineered bioartificial kidney will yield some of the other benefits beyond just filtration. Uh, and so we know from dialysis, dial can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. We know from dialysis that it's uh, life-saving in the short or immediate term. But over the long range, uh, after five years, the uh, life uh, uh, expectancy is about 35% uh, compared to transplantation where we can implant a functional organ, uh, the life expectancy uh, survival at five years is about 85, 86%. And so um, there's something beyond just filtration that the kidney provides. and. Uh, and, and so we have to, to, to see and try to afford that extra life benefit from you know, implanting the right cells that produce, let's say, erythropoietin um, or other types of endogenous factors that actually lead to um, decreased um, uh, coronary artery disease or other things that are accelerated on dialysis or when we do just simple filtration. Right. From a, a pathologist's point of view, it's intriguing the um, proprietary na nature and sort of the secrets going on inside the uh, bioreactor part of what Shuvo is doing, that you, you can imagine that they will be examined from a pathologic point of view at some point by somebody, but it's likely to be, you know, the company that actually de designs the sort of teabag-like structure that they're in. And what the, those cells look like what they're doing, how they're surviving is, as you say, crucial to the thing overall working because you could never create just through synthetic parts an entire functioning kidney. You have to have the sort of um, cells there working or, or you, you really don't have a full system. Um, the, the whole concept of the bio reactor is 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 fascinating to me when when you look at Harold Ott's uh, video from Nature Medicine if if you step back for a moment and, and realize that those kidneys are not being perfused by red cells there is no blood so if you had a leak it it, it might look like function and in fact completely decellularized kidneys produce some fluid coming out the ureter right so so it's, it's true that once the cells are in there, the, the character of that fluid is modified. But when they talk about uh, primitive urine, <laughs> it's sort of interesting. <laughs> the most primitive ur urine would be the perfusion fluid, unaltered, coming out the ureter, right? That, 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 that is the most primitive ureter, urine. And that would be the same as a major you know, bleed if you actually had red cells there. But you don't, right? So, so it's it's a little bit misleading to just look at this beautiful 
rodent kidney in, in there pouring fluid out the ureter and, and, and thinking that, that that is all urine as we know it, that it could sustain life and so on, and particularly that those kidneys could, you know, concentrate the urine. In, a, in addition to filtering wastes, I think a very common problem in, in, in stem cell made organs in the past has been that you don't have any long loops of uh, uh, Henley. They're sort of short circuits, right? So that you, you, you actually, in, in theory, could not concentrate the urine. Everything else would work. Um, so what are, you, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, how close are we, do you think, even in, in rodents, to have, having a, a neonatal cell or stem cell uh, generated organ that would actually sustain life? Uh, well, uh, you know, we don't, I think in terms of an animal, you're talking about an animal, let's say, yeah. uh, we could be pretty close. I mean, another year or two, it's quite possible. It depends on really what organ you're looking at, liver, kidney, or so, so forth. Um, I think in animal models, uh, as a field, we've moved uh, uh, quite fast in being able to at least put the, the, the right cells there. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, you may see it in, um, in a lung or a liver, maybe soon in a, in a kidney as well. It's just, um, I mean, you can get the basic uh, components there that may extend life for a couple of days and then um, there could be other uh, limitations down the line so mm -hmm. edema or Im improper fluid balances and so forth and then you know there's more challenges that need to be worked out but uh, right. I think that uh, in terms of an animal model I think that is uh, quite likely in the uh, in the near future in the next right. couple of years if not sooner well, I'm, I'm showing uh, Harold's Nature Medicine uh, video quite widely, and it does impress uh, audiences. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I just wondered if, if I'm uh, sort of contributing to slight misinformation there. Okay. Hello. Uh, I apologize for the, the scrubs and everything just came from the lab, but... It's fine. Um, it's uniform. It's good. <laughs> I feel um, like I do think like you're research especially is very interesting and uh, somewhat related a little bit, but I'm dealing a little bit more on the other side where, yes, we are doing a whole transplantation and trying to improve the donor pool because we're dealing with lungs and how lungs primarily right now are being obtained from brain dead donors compared to DCD donors, for instance, right? So my first question then comes to like, why not have medicine, for instance, or can you see medicine collaborating. Why is there like such a dichotomy? It's like you're either in bi bioengineering, for instance, and regenerative medicine, or you're on the other side where it's like, no, we're looking for surgery, transplantation, and using, for instance, like an ex vivo lung perfusion system. I don't know if you've uh, heard of the machine or not. So like, why not see them like collaborating? Like start off with the whole regenerative like medicine, creating your own lungs from your own DNA, and then using, for instance, a circuit like that to treat or deal with the edema that you uh, like talked about, like obviously that would occur like further on down the road. Well, I, I think that's uh, the right way to go and the right approach is essentially what you're saying. So um, let me explain a little bit. And so the, the ex vivo lung perfusion um, by Dr. Kasheva in, in Toronto is, is really started by a surgeon. Um, and so in that area, there's a lot of collaborative work between not just surgeons, but yeah. basic scientists and so forth. And so um, in my approach, uh, what I try to do is bring together both uh, the medicine and the science. And so my background both as a um, biomedical engineer and scientist and, and a, a physician and surgeon uh, to try to bring both camps together. Um, but we, we do more than that. We need uh, biologists and yeah. uh, basic scientists, development of biologists, and pathology as well to make sure that we recapitulate the tissues appropriately in the laboratory. I think the way to 
go about that is something that a colleague of mine, uh, Jay Vacanti, had mentioned at a Tissue Engineering Regenerative Medicine Society meeting in December. Uh, whereas it's important really to bring the, the physicians and, and surgeons and medical personnel together with the researcher. And they each need to learn a little bit about each other's worlds. And so one way to go about doing that is to find the researchers, if you're a surgeon, and bring them into the operating room. They can't scrub in, they can't participate, obviously, but they can watch and understand how a transplant is performed. They can see the kidney or the graft on the back table, for instance. Uh, and then on the flip side, uh, the researchers uh, can bring the uh, physicians and the surgeons into the lab and show them uh, the new tissues uh, that they're creating um, uh, in the laboratory and in the bioreactors that are, are being developed. So um, our approach and, and the way we think about this is more of a big tent where we need to include um, as many people as we can because we, uh, you, we can't get to the finish line, we can't help patients without having a, a, um, uh, a multi-faceted um, really approach to developing these tissues. Okay. Um, and then the, the other question about, like for instance, well, like lungs for instance, how, I, I know you primarily deal with kidneys and like liver as well, you start looking into that, but how about lungs or hearts? Like how far are we with like bioprinting them or whatever, it is? yeah. I think the, the bioprinting technology is, uh, is going to really change the way that we think about manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's manufacturing airplane parts uh, or manufacturing uh, um, spare parts, uh, whether it be for uh, automotives or boats or, or, or people, for instance. So um, uh, one of the big shipping lines, for instance, are exploring bringing uh, 3D printers inside their cargo ships so they can reprint spare parts, whatever they need, when they're in the middle of the ocean. It would cut down on, on uh, shipping uh, time to actually get the spare parts to wherever the ship is or it, and cuts down manufacturing uh, as well. So 3D printing is going to change that. In terms of medicine, um, it's been able to, um, uh, to produce defined boundaries, for instance. In other words, we can very nicely create a section of one type of cell uh, in the midst of a secondary type of cell and try to see what uh, the interplay is across those defined boundaries that can be changed very easily based upon the CAD programs in 3D printing. The one current limitation of 3D printing is the scale or the resolution. So uh, now we can 3D print to probably a couple of hundred microns uh, in terms of the smallest resolution that we can get. However, that's too large for the small capillaries. Uh, and it's still challenging, although um, uh, it, we're able to kind of uh, overcome a lot of the difficulties in, in creating hollow um, tubes. But those limitations are transient. So as time goes on, just like uh, your cell phones um, used to be this big and now they're the size of a thin um, uh, iPhone, um, and chip technology has gotten smaller. Certainly, 3D printing is going to have better and better resolution as um, not just the, the uh, electrical engineering or the programming to actually build the printers um, get better over time, but also with the, the development of new quote unquote inks to, to do 3D printing as that um, gets better and better from a material standpoint. Point and it allows different inks that can form um, solid structures rapidly um, and prevent deformation is going to kind of change the way that, that 3D printing happens. So it's a process yeah. and we get there. Okay. Uh, last question, I guess. Uh, which organ like is the hardest or the most difficult to like, like deal with, for instance, when it comes down to like bioprinting or bioengineering? Like in regards to scaffolding and having all the cells with the ECMs and everything like lining up together to produce a like a functioning organ. 
think they're all they're all going to be hard. They're all difficult. Um, but I think that uh, um, when we look at the different geometries, look at liver and we look at kidney, um, I think that kidney, in some sense, is going to be a little bit more challenging because um, there's no symmetry. Um, whereas the liver has a degree of symmetry because the lobule has symmetry. Um, the kidney, the, the, the way that the um, nephron is formed, isn't symmetrical, per se. So that might differentiate the two a little bit. Um, or a little bit further in terms of developing um, uh, or, or differentiating stem cells and liver progenitor cells, or hepatocyte cells, than we are on the kidney side. Um, but really, at the end of the day, all challenging. It's not an easy task. But that's what makes it exciting. And I think that, um, uh, you know, considering the amount of, of, of folks, patients, that we take care of on a daily basis that are kind of needing organs for transplantation or tissues in general uh, is really kind of the, the, the emphasis that kind of drives a lot of the research here. All right, thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, hello, um, I'm a visiting pathology resident here and I was lucky enough to be part of this session. Um, very interesting work and I have a question. Obviously, as a pathology person, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with tumor and cancers and so on. I was wondering if there is any data available or how do you conceive that the tumorogenic risk of this these kind of organs would be? Well, we have to, that's a good question. Uh, that's a very good question. I think we have to be very patient uh, and careful with uh, the technology of developing um, organs from, from stem cell science. Um, uh, there's been certainly some concern in the community with regards to uh, genetically uh, modified cells and, and if they would degenerate into uh, uh, to cancer, essentially. Um, and so the answer is we, we don't know. It's something still that we have to evaluate definitively. Um, but I think that, and as, um, uh, as Dr. Solez mentioned in the beginning part of the session, is we're now really starting to be able to have animal models of engineered tissue or tissue that's developed from, from cell lines. And as we can further develop these animal models, those will provide information as to safety of, of the cells that we use and the overall tissues that are developed. And so that's going to be uh, an important aspect of animal models to evaluate uh, where do the cells go? Do they move around? Do they traffic out of the organ? What's the response of the animal to that um, uh, engineered uh, uh, tissue? So um, now with the new animal models that are coming online, we'll be able to, uh, to address those questions. Um, I think early on, it, it seems that at least in the short term, uh, there should be a good safety profile from the stem cell science side of things. But, uh, you know, we're, our time horizons aren't just a couple of weeks, but you know, we want tissues and organs to survive for, for years on end. And so that's where the kind of models will come into play um, uh, as the stem cell technology um, matures as well to provide all of the cell populations that we need. And my second question is about, um, so in your experiments where you do a lot of manipulations of the stromal cells, obviously, or stromal structures, have you noticed like any um, significant changes between stromal in the um, organs that are developed versus the native or original organs in your studies? Have you noticed any, anything that has been different in the scaffolding or the... Um, architecture of the tissue? So that's a great question, and, and that's really, that's one of the things that we're trying to do right now. So um, as a, a step towards developing these, these tissues in the laboratory, traditional uh, cell culture, as you know, has always been in two dimensions. And there hasn't been as many studies, obviously, looking at how cells grow in three dimensions and how support cells or stromal cells signal to those other cells. 
And so we're just beginning to kind of look at that crosstalk between the stromal cell population uh, and the stem cell population and the whole extracellular matrix. Uh, and that crosstalk between those three different um, portions of the, that make up the matrix, essentially, the cells, uh, number one, that are of interest, number two, the stromal support cells, and then that structure, the ECM, how do they all relate to each other? And as time goes on, we're beginning to understand that a little bit more. And so um, that, to answer your question, we're trying to figure that out right now to first understand how do the cells grow in three dimensions and how can we um, push them further to maturity based upon orientation in that scaffold. So it's a good question. Uh, it's just something we're, uh, we're trying to get those answers uh, as we speak. Thank you very much. So I, I've been thinking that probably we'll, we'll end up with a kind of uh, compromise of organs that work well enough to be used clinically but are not absolutely normal. For instance, is it a problem that a kidney that's functioning normally has occasional podocytes just wandering around in you know, the interstitium? They, they probably wouldn't do anything harmful there. They, they don't really serve, serve any purpose there. They should be in the you know, glomeruli, but, but as you know, the models up until now, if, if you put some cells in through the vascular supply, some in, up through the ureter, you end up with some cells located in sort of funny places. And I think we could live with that as long as the organ worked. So I, I see from a pathologist's point of view a fascinating uh, sort of new classification of you know, abnormalities in the stem cell generated or neonatal cell generated organ and some of those would be trivial things that only a uh, you know, pathologist would be interested in because the organ has been shown to work fine. And some of them would be killers that, you know, in, an organ with that particular change that we're seeing here just cannot function in a way that would actually support life. And, and this, to me, is an exciting new discipline of uh, anatomical pathology um, coming along. Um, do you also see it that, that way? Of course, the alternative, which would be very, very bad, is if every change seen is just artifactual one-off and only seen in that person's hospital, that person's lab. And so there are as many different abnormal changes in the stem cell generated kidney as there are centers putting in those kidneys and no classification is possible and no sense can be made of it. But I, I think that's an, uh, an unlikely outcome. The more likely outcome is there would be common reproducible changes, some of which would be crucially important to patient care and some wouldn't, and it's important to sort them out. That's right. So um, I think that uh, that's going to probably open a whole new field in probably not just anatomical pathology, but also molecular diagnostics as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I think what, what we would like to do, particularly our, because our approach right now deals with very small rodent kidneys, um, we can't take a biopsy because taking a biopsy is essentially going to uh, sample, <laughs> sample yes. about a quarter of the kidney. Right. Um, and so uh, being able to link biomarkers uh, to what's going on in the kidney as it develops in the scaffold um, or develops uh, in the bioreactor um, is going to be important to give us information. And so what we need to do um, as the technology matures is develop a sense of uh, release criteria. In other words, what, when do we know that an organ or a tissue has developed enough uh, in the laboratory that we can then implant it into the recipient animal, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, or develop an animal model? Uh, when is enough enough in the bioreactor? And so, um, in addition to kind of developing or assessing the pathologic characteristics, being able to non-invasively uh, measure how the scaffold or, or, a, or a tissue is functioning in the bioreactor will be important as well. So um, we've been looking at a couple of parameters as well to kind of track 
um, track the cells as they are developing in the scaffold and as they're recovering from, let's say, uh, injury, which would be uh, which would be caused by inoculating the, the, the cells in the scaffold. Um, and, and so that's a whole other area too, being able to uh, develop these biomarkers and correlate with pathology. Yeah. Well, um, let's see if any, any of the other students. Emily, you're you're looking brave. <laughs> so, she she has her uh, Royal College exam, which is like very crucial to her future. Exactly a week from today, so time becomes very special. <laughs> Hello. Hi. How are you? Thank you very much. Good, thanks. Um, I'm mostly interested in, I guess, how or what kind of research tools there are around getting the correct orientation of cells. Because in, and I'm not very well versed in this at all, but as far as I know with the inoculation of cells, you don't necessarily control their orientation, which specifically in the kidney would be very important for going the right direction, tubules versus glomeruli and all those types of things. So I was just wondering what kind of markers or um, signals might have been studied in that case. Yeah, so that's a very good question. And so as you've heard from the, the talk that I gave at the World Transplant Congress uh, earlier uh, in, in today's session, what we do is we infuse the cells into the arterial system and they get into the what appear to be the tubules or the, the peritubular tissue. Um, and we've gone forward a little bit uh, more in terms of the, the research to, to look at orientation. Um, and somehow cells actually are instructed, um, we think by the matrix, um, where is the apical, where is the basilar interface? And so, uh, we, uh, along with some of our collaborators uh, in New Mexico, have been looking at um, cilia markers to make sure that the, those proper markers are actually on the tubular uh, surface of endothelial cells. Uh, and actually, we, we've gotten some, some pretty astounding results that you know, nearly all cilia markers are actually on the, the, the tubular side. So. Um, even though they're injected in a random process or randomly into the, into the arterial system, as you had said, um, they do find their way to, uh, to the tubules and that does appear to be in a proper orientation. And we think that that suggests that there's some crosstalk between those cells and the matrix, um, or at least understanding from a uh, Architectural standpoint, where the lumen is, and they're able to uh, to adjust to. That. So, that's actually one of the things we're trying to work out right now on a molecular standpoint to understand what instructs the cells. But it's the phenomena that that we see. So, that's a that's a good observation on on your part. And I guess as a follow up or associated question to that, we we talk about making new organs in laboratories, but do you think in the future, if we can potentially inoculate cells and give them the right signals or they might have the right signals from the rest of the kidney, do you think there would be in the future, um, if people with kidney disease could be given the cells that were damaged inside their kidney, like um, done in vivo in a person? So just one part in terms of character, is, is your question, could they give the cells back to the same patient? Is that what you're trying to ask? Do you think somewhere in the future, we were talking about making kidneys in the lab, but do you think we could eventually use those cells to actually in inoculate them or infuse them into a real person who has a kidney disease to replace the cells that are damaged? Yeah, so there, there's, been a, there's been at least one clinical trial of using stem cells uh, in patients with renal dysfunction um, and injecting those cells uh, into the kidney. Uh, now, I don't, I don't know the details of that study or the results at the, uh, the end of their evaluation, but um, there has been some investigation in terms of doing that. 
Uh, and the hope is from, from uh, those groups that uh, those cells would have some repair uh, uh, capability that they can repair some of the damage that's already been done in chronic kidney disease. And so um, I think that as you move forward in terms of managing these chronic diseases, where, whereas it's chronic liver dysfunction or, or renal dysfunction, uh, we have an opportunity to uh, repair and, and generate the patient's own organ um, using stem cells or other types of, of cytokine factors to stimulate the generation. Uh, or if we get to a point where a patient needs a transplant, uh, then using uh, regenerative medicine um, strategies to develop those organs then for a transplant when they need them uh, if the disease has progressed to that standpoint. So it's kind of a continuum obviously in chronic kidney disease and, and if we can intervene at some point in that continuum and try to slow the progression of chronic kidney disease or reverse it, uh, then we've certainly helped patients but some they get to a point where they need a replacement of function then to be able to have tissues when they, when they need it. But there's a lot to do between now and then, and some of the, the focus in, in our group is to really understand how do the stem cells function and differentiate and, and, and become those tissues uh, in three dimensions. So there's a lot of work to do between here and there uh, with a lot of applications either to, um, to the to chronic disease or even um, diagnostics, uh, and that's one of the things we haven't really talked about yet. Thanks very much. Sure, thank you. So um, I'm thinking that, that uh, we, we're going to learn a lot about what uh, stem cells and neonatal cells and, and progenitor cells, how smart they really are, you would think that the only kind of quote unquote intelligence that they need is to participate in normal embryogenesis in, in the, the normal ways that you know em embryos develop. Whether they can take cues in an abnormal environment when, when things are moving at a whole different time frame at a different point in the, the organism's life and so on, and still make sense of things and, and, and you know, position the right cells in the right places. It would be wonderful if that turns out to be the case. But I, I guess it wouldn't be too surprising if it's not completely perfect, right? So I think that's what you, you and I are both dealing with now, is what not completely perfect will mean in the future. Right. Exactly. So, you know, I think that what, what we do with our bioreactors is try to simulate as much in vivo conditions as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we know that when we put the cells in and we develop tissue, it's not going to be an exact replica. Um, and so we need to know how close do we need to get. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's one thing. And so we do know that if that if we, uh, if we don't need 100% renal function, uh, we could probably do okay with about less than 50% renal function um, because we know that in, in uh, living donors who donate one of their kidneys, they have a, a normal uh, uh, longevity and, and lifespan with that singular uh, kidney that's half of their renal function. So uh, we don't know how, 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 how good we have to get in order to actually um, sustain quality life and that's one thing that I said but work in the, uh, the animal models will, will help us with. On the uh, tissue side is that I think that we do know that in some regards the, the, the scaffolding or the matrix is, does have some instructive capability to it. What we're trying to do is understand what those instructions are and understanding that that might not be uh, a perfect milieu, but 
uh, using uh, different approaches in nanotechnology, we can also deliver specific ligands uh, in various formulations to help um, mature cells in, in various directions as well. And so uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a way that you know, biology will, may give us the answers in terms of how things work. We may not be able to completely recapitulate that in nature, so to speak, in the bioreactors, but we may be able to, to, uh, to instruct through, uh, through nanotechnology approaches as well. What I've felt it is that at the end of the day, as we get closer and closer to a clinically useful functioning stem cell generated organ, that traditional knowledge of kidney physiology and all that sort of thing is actually useful um, in a way that probably a lot of people nowadays don't think it is. They, they think what they learned in school a long time ago were, were, for, were forced to learn about the intact nephron uh, hypothesis, a lot of old ideas like that, come to be important again in a setting where you've repopulated most but not all of the cells, most are in the right places, most of the structures right but not quite all, and how is that kidney going to function? I think that the collaboration amongst all parties, including those who just don't want to think about regenerative medicine at all right now, is actually quite quite important in the future. And, and in particular, you know, these three components of the bioengineered kidney, xeno transplant, and the stem cell generated kidney, they're, 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 there's a lot of uh, overlap. I mean, what what's going on in, in Shuva Roy's bio reactor beyond the filter there, which is crucial to what he's set up, is not, you know, dissimilar to the same sorts of things that you're thinking about and that would would make for a successful xeno transplant. So I've been been astounded, you know, I talked to a lot of, I guess you'd say regular renal physicians and they they all almost uniformly, even the leaders, regard this as something outside of their lives. You know, this is something that specialized people outside of kidney medicine are doing that is going to completely make their work redundant at some point in the future, but for now they just don't want to think about it. And, uh, you know, I, I, it, it sounds funny, like no one would actually say those words, but they are actually saying those words. It, it's, it's easy, I think, to think that your life in renal medicine is mainly, you know, dialysis and, and uh, you know, aloe transplantation. It, it always has been, always will be. And, and uh, you know, you just don't want to think about these things, whereas you actually have the knowledge that is maybe crucial to figuring out how the regenerative medicine organ is, is actually going to function, how to make it better, how to make this practical, how to move it toward the clinic more rapidly. Do you feel, as I do, that, that there needs to be more communication uh, between groups? Like when the AST set up the regenerative medicine uh, community of practice, that was, that was great. As, as, as long as it doesn't become a walled garden that, you know, the idea is, okay, those guys over there are going to sort this out and come back 10, to, 10 years later and tell us how things are. You know, there needs to be communication between that, you know, community of practice and, and the others. Well, yeah, I think that's right. So, I mean, I think it, if, if we kind of, at the beginning part, we talked about the kind of, uh, renal physiology, um, and if we're talking about in the kidney, that's exquisitely important and, and something that um, really can't be lost in terms of the research that that we're doing in the kidney. Um, and so um, uh, it's important to, to first of all to, to to bring those folks along and to enter and to include them in the discussion. Um, because recapitulating or understanding that physiology and, and um, uh, 
of filtration or even the transport inside the, the uh, epithelial cells of the tubules are going to be very important um, as well. So um, we certainly need the, the, the renal physicians, renal physiologists, and renal pathologists, you know, when we're talking about the kidney. Yeah. Um, I, I think that um, uh, it, it's an opportunity, I think, to, to educate a little bit and to, to through education, try to inform uh, other folks about, about what we're doing. And I think that um, a lot of it is, is really understanding how do the cells grow and differentiate uh, in three dimensions. And that's, I think, the early stages. I mean, I think developing a, 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 a whole organ is, is years off, obviously. It's extremely complicated. Um, and it's hard to kind of fathom sometimes the, the uh, end goal for a lot of folks. But if we look at some of the more immediate type of, um, of questions that we're answering, uh, it's not really that far off from, from what uh, other folks in, in renal physiology, for instance, are, are, are looking at in a, um, in a developing uh, mouse or, or even a zebrafish, for instance. Yes. Well, I, I, a long time ago, I wrote an essay saying that renal medicine began with technology, and the physiologists got really upset. They said, no, it began with physiology. But really, it, 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 it began with both, and those same technologies are, 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 and physiologies are, are going to be crucially important that as we move forward with whatever will be that will eventually replace uh, allo transplantation as, as we know it today. Um, so are, are there other students? Come on, there <laughs> must be. What's the worst that, that could happen? Come on, you can come down here and come on. Uh, <laughs> no one else? Really? Well, heck, okay. So we, we have uh, nine minutes left here. Um, I, I should say that, that um, we, we're quite proud of the, this kind of flipped classroom deal. You know, you can imagine it, it would have been a much greater challenge for you if you had to put together a lecture with slides and all that sort of thing. So I, I think we would like to keep doing this with you. We may get uh, Harold Ott also on, on you know, another uh, occasion. This, this happens to be an area that you probably sense that I'm quite interested in. And the, the course is actually evolving. In the beginning, none of the students had a medical background. And now maybe two or three or four do. So to, to have a, a um, you know, discussion like we've had today, um, I, I, I didn't get the sense looking at their faces that we had really lost any of them. There, there are periods of, you know, they're, where they're thinking about something else, maybe, but so it, it uh, works pretty well. Natter, you, yeah. Natter in his surgical garb with a coat. I, I don't think you can wear that coat into the OR. That's not sterile, you know. Yeah. Uh, hi again. Uh, so just a quick question that came to mind. Uh, in regards to stripping away pretty much the cells and creating or leaving behind the scaffold and then using those various cells, whether it's stem cells, et cetera, like you were mentioning, and then using the scaffold as almost like a blueprint, correct? If I understand, like that's how like the bioreactor kind of works to create the organ? Uh, that's right, yes. Like, okay, so... How is it that you can take these cells, for instance, which, like you said, like from various 
like animals or species, like por porcine or like from pigs, for instance, and obviously some will be from humans, and for them to like recognize a scalpel, because what is a scalpel, for instance? It doesn't have like a certain like DNA, like blueprint, right? So how is it that it's not recognize it as foreign, like those cells as foreign, and like allowing it to actually like the cells to come on it and then pretty much just like bind and start differentiating and all that. Right, a couple of, a couple of things. So. Um, and that's actually a really neat question because um, uh, we think that the exceller matrix presents to cells uh, specific ligands um, or addresses, for instance. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to determine right now, or what are the, what's the difference in those spatial addresses between kidneys uh, from uh, uh, rodents or pigs or humans, in other words, mm -hmm. um, and you know, what would help you know, direct cells to specific locations. We know from some of the work in that talk that you saw, these are rodent kidneys, but we injected a human cell line in, and those cells were able to uh, go to where the tubules are. And so, we do know that there's a lot of homology between organ structure. It's not complete homology, but there is a lot of it between uh, different species. In terms of immune recognition, uh, there's been some early studies suggesting that the extracellular matrix is not going to elicit that much of an immune response, or, or any at all. I'm a little bit hesitant in terms of that, and so I usually kind of say that um, using a foreign extracellular matrix may elicit immune response. Certainly it would be less than if we used a whole organ with the cells from a different species or individual. Uh, so we, it's a possibility we still may need to have a level of immunosuppression but my hunch is that level is going to be much lower than in conventional allogeneic transplantation. So we'll have to, to see. Since we have a couple of questions, uh, a couple of minutes, I have a question for you. Can you tell me a little bit about the work that you're doing? Um, <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'll try my best. Uh, so as I mentioned, like the different donor pools. So currently right now, the lungs are being, like the most suitable transplantable lungs are from the brain dead donors. However, like in Canada or Alberta, at least, like we see that there's like a 20 to 25 percent mortality rate every year. So as Toronto and it originally started in 2001 by 16 in Sweden, this machine called the ex vivo lung perfusion system, where it instead of taking the lungs from transplantation and the goal center was putting it on ice to try to lower the metabolism of the cells and reduce cell death and then traversing or traveling to the recipient site during that time and then reperfusing it, it results in ischemic reperfusion injury. So we're trying to use this machine, prevent pretty much the whole cold ischemia period, and then maintaining everything almost physiological condition, and then hopefully taking lungs that are deemed unsuitable for transplantation due to certain criteria and perfusing it over a span of clinically right now is four hours, but we're trying to find that ultimate perfuse to allow us to perfuse it for a longer period of time, and therefore allowing further repair and maybe in the future like gene therapy and cell therapy. Right, and that I think is the uh, I think that's the immediate implementation right now yeah. of regenerative medicine, for instance, in transplantation. And that's being able to regenerate or rejuvenate some of these organs and, and shift them from being in a, in a category that they're non-transplantable yeah. to move them into a category in which it's safe to transplant them um, by one means or another. And so um, that certainly kind of widens the, uh, the donor pool yeah. and, and essentially it's going to be the somewhat of a, of a roadmap or blueprint in terms of mm -hmm. Um, developing these tissues um, uh, in a bioartificial manner, um, but by using some of the, or taking an example of the fusion devices that, that you and others are, are, uh, are developing. So that's great work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Okay, well, uh, we've got uh, two minutes left. I, I want to thank you very, very much for joining us today. I, I hope it was good for you. There, there have been a few little glitches on the technical side. The call recorder part of Skype wasn't working. So, but we have multiple video cameras <laughs> going and so on, so we'll patch together um, stuff. But it, 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 I think I, I can assure you that as spectacularly good as the video from today is, the, the video from the next term, the next time you do this, will be even better. So your, your life interacting with us will just get better and better over time. <laughs> well, that's, that's terrific. The video on my end has been uh, very good, and um, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me really to, to talk with you, um, and, uh, and a lot of the enthusiastic students that you have taking your course, uh, they've, they've certainly uh, in-depthly read and understood the material and actually are, are, um, are presenting some very probing questions to really get at the heart of of regenerative medicine and where the technology is going in the future. And so um, I'd be happy to come back and, and uh, discuss more as, uh, as we um, progress things. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, this has been great for us uh, today, and, and thank you very, very much. And we look forward to the next time and the next time and the next time. So. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.